start here. Picking a project to serve as a follow-up to a very impressive feature debut has oh, to be a very high-pressure situation <laughs> there. You know, like, I can't imagine saying no to a Stephen King adaptation with Blumhouse right. involved, but in addition to that, maybe, why did you feel like Firestarter was the right next move for you as a director? You know, it was a, a project that you just, first of all, right, a Stephen King thing? I mean, you know, what are the odds? What are the... You know, it's it's a funny. I in 2017, I was at the Overlook Film Festival. It was the inaugural event. It was at Mount Hood, where they the Shining Hotel, uh, and I was in the audience when Jason Blum and Akiva announced they were making Firestarter. I was just a fan, just at a festival as a fan, and I was in the third row. And I turned to my friend. I was like, "That's a good idea. Like Firestarter would be cool." And you know, here we are. Five years later, and that's the movie I made. It's it's kind of a strange thing. Like, who would have expected it? At the same time, that was one of my favorite Stephen King novels. And it was certainly one of the first ones I read. It was one I identified with. I have a lot of kind of other weird connections to it in that before filmmaking, I was in clinical research. And I used to do drug studies like the Lot 6 trial. Um, so it just spoke to me in a certain way. And I thought, OK. I, I could make a version of this that that both leaves the original uh, 1984 adaptation intact um, and then it goes off in its own direction. So I don't know, it just kind of all came together. So even with your prior experience, what part of the production process on this movie, which I have to imagine is a much bigger production, maybe mm -hmm. a higher mm -hmm. budget than the visual. Sure. What, what kind of came with the biggest learning curve for you? Something new or different about the way you make a movie of this scale? Yeah, I would say, you know, the effects. The effects are definitely a, a big piece. It's just the amount of planning and preparation that go into it. We, you know, more than 90% of the effects overall in this film are practical. Um, and then for the fire stuff, it's not more than 95% practical. And so in order to do that, you just, it's just very in-depth conversations very early on, um, and decision-making, you know, you make decisions in early pre-production that are going to have ramifications three or four weeks into shooting. And it's just, you know, understanding where everything, where all the pieces are and where you're going. Um, definitely a learning curve. A, a lot of it is about who you bring to the table and I had an amazing crew and they were, you know, they were full bore into it and ready to go and kept everyone safe. And despite some, you know, pretty big effects with flamethrowers and things, uh, <laughs> it all worked out. So you said ramifications three to four weeks into shooting. Can you give us an <laughs> example of maybe something you learned that had to change a part of the process later on? Sure. I mean, there's a lot of like stunt work where, you know, for example, there's a sequence where we've got Rainbird being thrown up into the corner of a wall, which is a wire pull with stunt people pulling pulling him, his stunt double back up into the wall. And you want it big, right? You want it big and exciting. And of course it breaks the wall. Um, so then you're like, oh, we gotta, <laughs> we gotta fix this wall. We gotta reinforce this. It's stuff like that where everything goes in practice without a hitch and then you get to those moments. Um, and yet, you know, that I believe that's the take we used because, right, there's a lot of power to it. So you prepare for everything and then you have to spin if you need to. I can understand that. All right, going back to the script phase now, I have a feeling that there's a whole lot of answers to this question I'm about to ask, but <laughs> can you name something from either the source material or that original film that you absolutely knew you had to incorporate in your own film, but then can you also give us an example of something that, you know, you pinpointed and strove to, I guess, either change or maybe evolve in a way that's specific to your fire starter? Yeah, I knew from the beginning that Lot 6, the Lot 6 experiment needed to be a part of this film. Um, how it was going to manifest, what we were going to see of it was going to be different than the original film. Uh, but that was crucial. It was crucial for the storytelling and for understanding things. And it felt like I could do something interesting with it. Uh, in terms of changes, um, the role of Captain Hollister, um, I felt as though we had seen the character Martin Sheen portrayed in the original adaptation. I'd seen that guy before. Um, and so I thought, I thought we could make a different character here. Somebody with kind of a different perspective. 
and then getting Gloria Rubin in for that role was was amazing, and she really she really gave I think a a really nuanced take on the sort of character that we've seen before in movies, the the general who's running the show, who you know has the country in mind versus the individual. I felt like she did something interesting, uh, particularly with kind of going with this motherly route that she does. I have more questions about changes, but I'll save that for the end when we're talking spoilers. Uh, first year, I was reading the uh, the production notes, and it said that, you know, when you signed on, you and Scott together, I think it said solidified the script with your combined vision. So it made me curious, what wasn't in the original draft that mm. you wanted to bring to the table when you first joined the project? Yeah, I mean, the luckily... A lot of it was there. It was more just drilling in onto some things. So I think, you know, the biggest piece for me is the relationship between Andy and Charlie and the kind of parenting child relationship. Uh, and so I think I really wanted to focus even more on those discussions of, I mean, I make it, it sounds boring, but I want to focus more on the discussions of how to parent and the tension and like, how do we take care of this child? And she's a ticking clock. She's a time bomb. She's, you know, things are going to get worse. What happens when she gets upset? I wanted to play with that suspense. And so I think, you know, a lot of it was navigating that stuff. Um, and then, you know, in terms of stuff that I wanted to put in there. Lot 6 is another example of, I think the original vision of Lot 6 was more akin to the first film or the book, and I wanted to give it a different spit. I wanted to, to show a different version of that. Okay, I'm doing it. I'm putting up the spoiler warning for okay, our viewers. Right. You could talk about everything freely, and like I, I have ideas in my head for this particular question, but I'm wondering for you, is there any particular big change you made to the source material that, you know, proved most challenging to pull off or maybe you're you're most nervous to see how viewers receive it? So Rainbird is the biggest change to the, you know, in terms of the characters. Um, when I first read the script, the, the ending that's in our film was on, in the script. And to me, it was almost like a seven moment. Like when I first saw seven and like the what's in the box scene, it was like, wow, that's bold and that's different and I love it. And so for me, I called it the Frankenstein ending because I wanted the monsters to walk off together. Um, and so keeping that was key. Um, and I was nervous about it and whether it would work and whether people would buy it. Um, so part of it was just kind of reverse engineering to make sure that people understood who Rainbird was as without getting exposition-y. Um, it, but it's what I'm, I'm really proud of. I, I feel like the ending did exactly what I wanted it to. All right. I'm glad you brought up Rainbird because one of my last questions for you here. So again, I was reading the production notes and one of the things it said was that you built an incredible backstory for Rainbird yes. with Michael. So are there right. any details from that that you can yeah. share that maybe we don't see in the movie, but we can kind of feel influencing the character along the way? Yes, 100%. So he, a lot of what Michael and I came up with is in the film. It's just not said. So it's his clothing, it's his music, it's the tattoos. So if someone were to go through the film and kind of pause on the Rainbird scenes, if you paused and looked at his tattoos and looked at what each of them means, it will tell his story. The one big piece I'll point out is there's a sequence in his apartment where the camera scans past a drawing board with all these drawings that he's done. Those drawings tell the rest of the movie from that point. In fact, the very ending shot of the movie is in the center of that drawing board because of what Rainbird's real ability is, is hinted at there in that, you know, it's essentially, he can see the future. Um, and so all those pieces, his past in the Lot 6 trials, his future, how he identifies with Charlie, it's all, it's all there. It's just, you know, you see it for like 20 seconds. <laughs> now I'm going to have to go back and rewatch it and like pause frame by frame, yeah, find all the details. Right. All right. I got to let you go. Big congratulations on the movie. Thank and you. Can't wait to see yet another one. All right. Awesome. Thanks so much.